Good evening and welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I am your host, Jeff Schubert. Glad you can join us. My guest tonight, script consultant Pilar Alessandra, is quoted as saying, my goal is to take the mystification out of screenwriting. In my opinion, in her DVD, On the Page, Alessandra does just that. Her background includes being a senior story analyst for DreamWorks and Radar Pictures, an instructor with the UCLA Writers Program. She's trained writers and story analysts at ABC Disney, Nickelodeon, and numerous writing conferences, including the American Screenwriting Association, the FTX Film and Television Festival, and Creative Screenwriting Magazine Screenwriting Expo, say that ten times, where she's an annual star speaker. Here tonight as my star guest is Pilar Alessandra. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I tell you, I got to tell you, I love, love, love your DVD. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a great tool for writers. Great. I'm glad. Now, so you've been involved either in the capacity of doing coverage, teaching, analysts for a lot of years. How many scripts would you say you've read? Ah, oh, I don't know. I, thousands. Thousands. Yeah. Easily, right? I, yeah. I, I've been doing this. I've been reading scripts, working on scripts for 15 years. Uh, I just aged myself, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm still I'm still consulting with uh, writers, maybe one or two writers a day. So yeah, you do the math. Well, I've read my first script when I was like 10, so that doesn't necessarily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I would say I would say quite a number. Quite a number. <laughs> what would you say then are, are some of the most uh, common things that writers get right and that they get wrong in the scripts that you read? Common things they get right and that they get wrong. You know. When they get it right, it's because they do something special. It's because they commit in a certain way to something that's unique, that's new. Um, when they get it wrong, to me, is actually when they play it safe, when they're writing for everybody except themselves. Uh, you can, you can, you get bored very easily with a safe script. You know, no matter how technically sound it is. Now, can everyone write? Can everybody write? Um, some people have this this natural gift. You know, the way they have a, a certain sense of poetry with pages, and, and I have seen first-time writers just nail it, right? But, so not everybody has that. But can everybody craft a good screenplay? Eventually, yes. They can chip away and chip away, and it becomes a really good movie. Now, yeah, because, I mean, with your DVD, my thought process is, after watching your DVD, you can write a script. If you mm -hmm. if you can't, now how good it is, right? That's that's another matter, and then you work on it from there. Yeah. But if, if you can't, I would say it would probably come down to writer's block, right? And and writer's block because the skills are all, you you have such wonderful exercises that we'll cover. Mm -hmm. But writer's block, emotional, fear based, or information based. You run out of information. I know you do some great podcasts, and you had a guest on your show, Doctor yeah. Doctor Darlene Menini. Menini. Yes, right. Yeah. Do you agree with that, or how, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. On that? She she came on the podcast, and one thing that she talked about, which is something that that I, I try to deal with in the DVD and in my classes, she talked about this idea of just stop for a second and do one thing. Just focus on that one story you're trying to tell, maybe in a scene rather than big picture. Um, or you can say to yourself, you know what, I'm not responsible for writing uh, Godfather, <laughs> you know, the next Godfather right now. I am responsible for um, hitting three pages tonight. And if you sort of take the responsibility, uh, take the weight off of your shoulders, hit one thing, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to nail this scene and go to bed, great. You know, it's, it's the fact that the writers, because they have these great imaginations, take the weight of the world on. They imagine all kinds of, of negative possibilities instead of just focusing on, on one thing. I think another concept she got into was also the idea of, right, narrow it down. Mm -hmm. Don't think in terms of writing a whole script. Think in terms of writing a page. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. Give yourself small, attainable goals. Right. So, so like in my classes, I always sort of have these, uh, I have this little 10-minute shtick. Right? right, 10 minutes. 20, 20 10 minute exercises. 20 10 minute exercises on the DVD, but also in, in classes that came out of having uh, done this with my writers in classes where I'll say, all right, you know, we're, we're going to work on this character and we're going to work on this character in this way. Here's the tool. I want you to try it right now. And what I, what I noticed was simply having them write and giving them 10 minutes to do it, a focused writing time, and, and saying no more than that, just 10 minutes they would get so much done. So sometimes it's, it's just allowing yourself you know, a little focused time and then saying, it's OK. I don't have to do it all day. I can leave. 
Right. <laughs> and, and one of the things you work on with character, right, every main character in a script has a flaw, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So you want them, you want your writers to flush out what their flaw is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that I think a lot of writing teachers have talked about, and you know, uh, we talk about this in literature as well. But you know, this idea of a flaw—it doesn't have to be a fatal flaw. It's just what makes us human, and it's the thing that we connect with 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 characters on the screen. So sometimes I'll start writers out from this, you know, you know, what's human about your character. Now that you know what that is, what kind of situation would your, would your character be least comfortable in? Right. And then we, we take it from there, because that's always a, a great place to start a movie. And then, you know, follow up with the question, how would that character then behave in that scenario right. with that flaw? Yeah, because usually they start off doing the wrong thing. And that's, that's what's fun about a movie, because we're the audience, right? And we sit there and go, I, that was wrong. Right. You know, hmm. And we, we spend, you know, two hours watching this person who started off not doing it so well learn things that eventually help him do it right. And, uh, and that's a movie. So you mentioned now you've been doing this for about 15 years. Yeah, 15 yeah. years. 15 years. <laughs> Looking good. Thanks. Now, how would you say the field, or has it, has it changed in those 15 years? Are there advantages, disadvantages to being a writer today versus 15, 10, 15 yeah, years ago? People are a lot more cautious. Um, you know, when I got into script reading, when I was script reading for, um, for Amblin and for DreamWorks, um, it was a really exciting time as far as uh, the, the spec and the overnight read and the, the bidding wars in the morning. People just wanted the great big idea and they were going to pay money for it. And you know what happened? They did pay a lot of money for it. And then they had to hire writers to rewrite some of those things because they were buying it on idea, not always on writing. And sometimes they made, you know, they spent a lot of money on things that didn't do that well, um, commercially or critically. Uh, now people are a lot more cautious, especially because of the economy. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, sometimes it's a little bit harder of a, more difficult of a time for a writer. Um, you know, they can't just do it on idea. At the same time, uh, it's really created more respect for the writing. You know, people want a good read, not just a big idea. So it, it's, uh, you know, I, I find it equally exciting of a time, but it, it is a little bit more difficult for the writer. So difficult to sell on just the pitch, but if right. you actually deliver the goods and right. you have that, that's where it's... Uh... People still, people always get excited about a well-written script. Um, something with great storytelling. Also, there's there's some interesting new opportunities for writers that certainly weren't around 15 years ago or even five years ago. Uh, you know, webisodes and writing for cell phone and you know, short form content that uh, you know can be seen on the net uh, the way that the internet is right now. You know, that may expand and expand, uh, but right now it's it's short form and there are executives out there that are looking through the internet and trying to find new writers all the time and these are you know not big studio you know proven produced writers these are writers at home who are just hammering out content and maybe putting it up on the net you know so it's a whole a, a whole new range of opportunities for writers definitely Great, and, and you cover some of that specifically in one of your podcasts as well, new media yeah, opportunities I, and so forth. I've right? been trying, in my podcast, I've been trying to bring new media people on because I need to learn about this. Um, Is this, it a different writing structure? Well, you're, it's, you're writing maybe three minute bits, 20 minute bits? Yeah, you know, you know there's that sort of, you know, no, they talk about that sweet spot of two and a half to five minutes. Um, the, the, the basic sort of principles of writing are the same. You know, you're going to you know, hit them with something in the beginning, you're going to involve them in the middle, and then you're going to surprise them in the end, but we're going to do it a so lot fast, quicker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm just interested when I have my guests on as to, well, how did they get it out to people? And, and also, you know, how are they uh, creating a career as a writer? You know, ultimately, you know, the writer wants to make money. Mm -hmm. How are they, you know, how, how is their story getting out there? Is the three-act structure the same today as it was 10 or 15 years ago, or has, has that evolved? I know on your DVD yeah. you talk about 120 pages used to be the standard script. Now maybe it's more 100 to 110. Yeah, it's definitely shorter. I mean, you know, uh, I, I don't teach with a 120-page model. Um, most, the average script comes in at 110, so that when I'm teaching, I usually actually have people think 100, you know, and that way you can think in sort of 25-minute chunks and it's actually easier to get through. It's going to help you with the writer's block. Um, but uh, 
it, I think that's also because we have been told stories, we've watched so many stories, that our mind takes certain shortcuts. You know, the minute that we see a bank robber in a certain situation, we don't have to see all the stages of the bank robbery. We've been there. We know. So now we're going to jump to something new. And so the, the pacing of movies is different, but it's because we're trying to get to new story beats. So uh, yeah, it's, it's still the same structure. It's a but little you, bit tighter. You break Act 2 up into like 2A and 2B, right? I do. I do. I like that, you know, a lot of times when I was reading scripts for studios, there was this vast wasteland of Act 2, you know, where somebody was just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I think, you know, a lot of uh, teachers have taught about, taught this and a lot of great producers. It, it's also instinct for a, a lot of good writers, which is that you get to that midpoint of a movie and things change up a little bit. They, they start to push forward in a new way. Um, characters that have come into the, into the script start interacting with other characters and messing with the main character. So it's got to change. And that's what makes Act 2B a little bit different from Act 2A. Okay. We have a message board question from Randall. He would like to ask you, supernatural mystery horror as a genre seems to have a different flow to the plot structure and the way central questions appears compared to most other genres. Can you comment or discuss this? Supernatural mystery horror. Uh, he, he has an example. Okay. Um, f uh, for example, in the recent film Taken, mm -hmm. we have the classic central question appearing at the quintessential 25% turning point. Well, we've got a real writer here. Oh, huh? my Lord. But in many supernatural thrillers, what often happens is that there is a gradual revelation of paranormal events with a gradual re revelation of the central question. Will the protagonist solve the mystery that is unfolding? Uh, you guys are going to have to fill in some gaps for some of us here. Hi, I'm Brian. If you didn't watch the pre-show, if you're watching On Demand, uh, fill in some gaps here and then answer the question, maybe. Uh, I was, as I was reading it, I'm just hoping Pilar understands this question. Uh, <laughs> this is a bit of a handful. I mean, I, I, I think without you know going home and studying this question, I don't know if I can answer everything. I don't necessarily think it, it has that much of a different structure. We're still... You know, think about any genre has got a beginning, middle, and end. Um, things are, you know, uh, tighter, scarier, more suspenseful in the genres that he's talking about. Um, I can't address, without hearing it again, I can't address his question of, of what happens to the protagonist. Um, but there, I, I do think that the thriller horror genre has introduced a different kind of storytelling that's really interesting, which is this idea of the contained thriller, the contained horror, the challenge of what happens if you get a, you know, a group of people in one place and then you sort of assault them with, um, with horrifying things, with uh, scary things, um, uh, threatening things. And it really actually challenges the writer because they're stuck in that place and they have to come up with, with new ideas. So sometimes it feels like it has a different structure, mm -hmm. um, but we're still sort of in this beginning, middle, end place. Right. I, I want to make it clear that I'm not hung up on three-act structure. I believe in beginning, middle, and ends, and knowing what those are. But I also think it's exciting that uh, we have taken this standard, linear way of telling a story, and that once we've sort of nailed it, we chopped it up into pieces, and we're not scared to tell stories backwards, or to start at the end and then work our way back up to that event. Um, I know this doesn't answer your question about the, the genre, but I'd also say, if I, I could give you a more specific answer, um, if, you, if you email me, and then I can read it over, and then I can be smarter about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you, what you said reminds me of, you know, the old eighth grade English teacher telling the class, you know, learn the rules of grammar, and then you can break them. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think the eighth grade English teacher should have told you to break them. Right. She usually just tells you the rules. Right. And then as a writer, you discover, wow, you know, I know all that. What happens if I purposely break one? You know? so. Cherry Pie would like to ask, when teaching, is there, on thing, is there one thing that you stress to your students to do that would make them a successful writer, or a script writer? Ah, is there one thing that I, I would stress? You know, in, in the class, Cherry Pie, there's, um, uh, there's a whole bunch of writing tools that will make them better at crafting certain elements of their screenplay. I mean, that's, that's my job, is to give you the tool and let you run with it. But overall, where I see um, a lot of, of students stop being students and start becoming successful commercial writers is where the confidence kicks in, basically. You know, confidence to the point of, 
of sort of an endearing arrogance sometimes. This idea that, you know what, my story is better than anybody else's story, and I'm going to get it out there. Or, yeah, that last one duh, didn't work so well, somebody didn't like it, too bad, I'm working on the next one. That is the one thing that I try and, and leave people with at the end of class, to say, you know, I can teach you all these craft things, but you have to go out there and have a thick skin and pursue and do it. So uh, a little, little arrogant confidence. That would so be my. It's a great trick. anecdote to fear, which you know, which is the cause of writer's block or mm -hmm. a cause of it. So there you go. It makes sense. The confidence would be a good thing. Absolutely. Uh, dialogue. That's one thing that you intentionally like to save for last mm -hmm. when you teach. Why? Yeah. Well, I love great dialogue. I don't get me wrong, but a lot of people hang their story on their dialogue rather than letting the dialogue come out organically because their story took their characters into a certain place and those characters are now sort of, they have to say what they say. And that's always a, a, a more realistic place to take characters. It feels better when you're watching it or when you're reading it. Um, so I deal with dialogue last. But between us, uh -huh. it's my favorite thing to teach. <laughs> it is. It really is. I can't wait to get to that class, you right. know? And, uh, and I know the writers who love writing dialogue are like, when are we going to talk dialogue? But it's like, sorry, you, you got to get your story down first. Well, staying with dialogue for a second, then what's the difference in showing and telling with dialogue? And showing and telling, well, you know, there's that whole exposition thing, right, that drives everybody crazy, whether you're, whether you're an audience member, whether you're a reader. I believe you refer to the exposition as the death of a script. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Suddenly, somebody's telling you either what you should have seen, what you're about to see, or sometimes what you are seeing. You know, it, it's, it's the ultimate dumbing down of a script. You don't need to explain something that you could show. Now, on the other hand, sometimes people are so scared to have the direct statement that I'll read scripts and I'll say, wow, this is really interesting and so cryptic and stuff. What is happening? You know, every once in a while, a cop might just say, we think the killer is so-and-so, you right, know? Right, right. Or a man might say to a woman, I love you. But it may take a while to get there. So when you say show, um, if you show the person dead, you don't have to say he's dead. Right. Is that right? Oh my I'm God, he's to, dead. Right? Yeah. He's yeah. dead, Jim. A Star Trek <laughs> flashback just, you know, hit me. That was for Brian. Uh, Bates would like to ask, do you recommend writers read a lot of scripts? What are your favorites to recommend? Are there any you'd recommend as bad examples uh, as far as what not to do? You know? I am not going to go into the crap <laughs> of telling you what is, you know, what movies I do or don't like. Okay. But, um... Uh, I do recommend that you read as many scripts as possible. Also, uh, try and read things that you really like that were written in the past five years because uh, the, the look and feel, the formatting of a script has changed. You know, we don't use camera direction anymore. It's much more in the moment. So uh, really look at contemporary scripts as well as the classics. Sometimes people will say, well, I, you know, I read Casablanca and Chinatown. I'd be like, that's great. You know, right. what have you read that's current? as well. Is it as helpful or does it make a difference to read scripts of movies you haven't seen versus movies that you've seen? Uh, you know, it's, it, it can be helpful. There's something called the blacklist. I don't know if you about, know about it. Um, the blacklist is a, is, is a list that's put out uh, by all the studio executives of their favorite reads that year. That doesn't mean that those scripts were made or necessarily will be made. They got the attention of the executive. They brought the writer into the room. They loved the read. And um, it is interesting for writers to try and get their hands on scripts like that. They may not have been read, but they got somebody's attention in a way that says, OK, this, this may be how I break into Hollywood. You know, people, should, people should know that you know, a spec, is, is the, the script that they're writing, isn't necessarily something that's always going to be made. What you're aiming for is work. You want to use it as your calling card to get work. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, the DP has a question. Uh, no, I have, a, I have a DP question. Oh, okay. I have a DP. Uh, you, you just mentioned, and I want to touch on this, that newer scripts do not include camera direction. And lately when I've been given a script, uh, I have a couple things I'm shooting uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. I hate when I'm reading a script and it says, like, camera pans down. So, and I'm just like, that's not your job. Just right. tell me what they're, where we are and what they're saying. And I remember reading the Fight Club script. Fight Club is one of my favorite movies. If you read that script, you it's almost impossible to see how they got from that script to 
to the movie you're watching because the only thing the script has is where are we and what the dialogue is and everything else is brought up upon the imagination of the crew that you get involved so what are your feelings on, on that you're saying new ones don't have that but how do you do it well Brian I, yeah. I'm gl so glad you brought that up because Pilar has come up with a great end around for DPs like you and directors so. <laughs> all right all right so how you can how can you direct without directing in your screen absolutely you direct without directing but, you know you're, you're right this idea of you know close up on you know pan to it's emotionless really uh, you know what is the emotion that you're bringing home so if you say you know uh, close up on Jeff's face you know that means nothing because in the pages I go okay I wonder what Jeff is feeling but if you say Jeff's face fills with fear you know Jeff's face fills with excitement okay now it's emotional and the camera of course is going to go close up in order to get that look on your face so that's the little trick so you're not pissing off Brian mm -hmm. and yet you're getting what you want at the absolutely same time. <laughs> absolutely and if they want to change it of course they can on set but you haven't tipped off as being like an unprofessional writer or a writer you haven't annoyed anyone absolutely you're still telling the story and you're you know you're guiding a shot um, the candle flickers versus close up on the candle. You know, of course, to get that flickering candle, we're going to go close up. There's a real marriage. I mean, the writer, the director, or the DP, you know, right. wants to feel that they understand the writer's intention, and then they can take that intention and do what they will. But I think they get just as frustrated by something that just says, you know, there is a candle, you know, right. or you know, close up sure, on. It sure. means nothing. Okay. Yeah. So we've talked about a little bit about dialogue. Dialogue and story, what do you find writers have more of a challenge with or trouble with? Dialogue or story, they have uh, the most trouble with story. It's really hard to come up with new plot points and keep it fresh and new takes on things. You know, that's, that's why I'm uh, consulting on it and right. you don't see me doing it, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, uh, so it, that is where they have the, the hardest job because um, you know, an audience is always challenging them on that. You know, oh, I've seen that before. I want something new, or or surprise me. Dialogue, yes, it's hard to make that authentic sometimes. But there are little things that you can do where you get in the rhythm of how a character speaks, and it can get easier and easier. It's funny because you know I like to write, and yeah, I'll be sitting there ten minutes, twenty minutes, hour, hour and a half. See an idea comes into my mind, but yeah. you know, coming up with the story idea mm -hmm. is the for me personally is the challenge. And then once it does, then all the you know the dialogue comes very naturally. Right. Um, another dialogue question: Do you feel how do you feel writers do in terms of writing how people do talk? You know, you mentioned authentically. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you go into an ice cream store, you might just say strawberry. Right. You won't say you know I would like to have a strawberry ice cream. You don't always say that. How do you feel writers do with that writing? You just edited a line really well, um, and that is, you know, half of what I do at, when I'm consulting with people is I'm going through and I'm scratching things out. I'm changing. I would like to have a strawberry ice cream into strawberry. And once writers get the hang of, you know, that's how we talk. We talk in partial sentences and in code sometimes. It actually means less work for them, and uh, and and they get it after a while. But it is it is something that sort of has to click for okay. you. Let's see, Delves a lot would like to ask, why do you think sequels are generally not as good as the original? Do the writers run out of creativity? Oh, Delves a lot says that. Delves a lot, you got a really good point. <laughs> um, I think that they're not as good because they become franchise projects. That, that sometimes the sequel is developed around um, something that sold really well. Maybe a, 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 a character that stole the show rather than something that's really taking the mythology, taking what really worked for the entire story and creating a new chapter. You know, sometimes they'll just say like, well, I loved it when that guy had that st stock line. We're just going to fill it with those stock lines, you know, or we're going to make sure it has these number of set pieces because that worked the first time. And then it just becomes, you know, all tricks and it's not it's not a new story, something that takes us to a new chapter. Relying on a formula. Yeah, it like. absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, in TV, like, shows go on for hours and hours and hours, seasons and seasons and seasons. Yeah. So it's not like it should be that hard, you would think, to take the characters and put them. But I guess for some reason in film, it's harder and different. And yeah, we got to, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it is that with good TV shows, um, 
you know, they're taking on a life of their own. You know, I, I think any, any writer on a TV show starts saying, you know, we didn't expect our character to do this. But now that they're doing this, we decided to have an episode that went in that direction. Or, you know, uh, we, what if, you know, what would be the worst case scenario with this? And it, it allows them to be so imaginative. I, I've been, you know, I've been getting locked into TV a lot these days, probably because I have kids and, you know. Right. But there's some really exciting stuff going on, I think. Great. Uh, kings of dot, dot, dot. Are short films subject to the same rules of writing as full length? Do you recommend anything differently? Um, the thing I would recommend with, with short film is, well, well, sort of two approaches. Either you've got a high concept and you're mining it, you know, in, in uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. You're sort of what ifing from the, from the top, you know. This guy wakes up and he's this. You know, and then we spend 10 minutes with the fun of that. That could be an interesting short film. Or uh, the second approach is that we're building, building, building to one shocking, surprising, delightful reveal at, at, the, at the end. If, you, if you're not doing either one of these things, it could be very day in the life. And we could sort of leave it thinking, and uh, what? You know, so I'm usually saying, if you're going to invest your time and your money, you know, get us you know, with some kind of hook either all the way through or right at the end. Now, another one of your guests on your podcast was Carl Iglesias, yeah. right? And yeah. you talked about writing for emotional impact, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I really liked was he included concepts like curiosity, mm -hmm. um, things that you wouldn't associate with being emotions as falling under the auspice. Anticipation, yeah. I think, was another one. Yeah. I, well, I... I, I think that that book resonates with so many people and that approach resonates with so many people because they've heard for so long, oh, don't direct an actor uh, on the page. Don't, uh, you know, they, they think that they're supposed to be emotionless in pages. And you're not. You need to convey emotion because emotion tells story. You know, there's a completely different st story with somebody being scared by something versus somebody being thrilled by something. Um, so that idea of, of that even, you know, curiosity is an emotion, it says, you know, what's the emotion of the scene? You know, that's, that's probably for Carl to teach. Right. But, but uh, we actually, sometimes we teach a class together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, our, our process, they're, they're very compatible because we do approach the pages this, this way. So a new writer comes up to you and says, I've never written before. I've got a great idea. Mm -hmm. What should I do? You should come to on the page. That's right. <laughs> um, um, what should they, they do? I usually say, you know, and then what? You know, they'll give me a great log line, and I'll say, that is a really good log line, and then what? So if they can say, well, then this, right. great. That tells me, great, you're on your way to a movie. If they say, well, that's it, I'm like, all right, I want you to go back, and I want you to, and then what, for a while, until you see the movie emerge. So it's, it's, that's what I would tell them, is, you know, keep building, keep building, keep building. And if the ideas keep coming to you, by all means, write it down. It's a screenplay. And then what should the goal be of the first draft? Uh, the goal of the first draft is to finish the damn thing, right? Mm -hmm. So many people start, and they want it to be perfect, and they get frustrated with themselves, and they stop, and they've got five incomplete screenplays in their closet. And, uh, and, and they hit a shrink, right? <laughs> so, you know, save yourself the shrink time and allow yourself to be terrible for a while. And even if you have to mark it with something really exciting happens here, I don't know what it is, but I want to get to the next place, fine. You know, mark it and then move on to the, the stuff that you do know. Just finish it. Yeah, I kind of half-jokingly was going to ask you, can you teach me to write a bad script, you know, because that's what a first draft, you know, really is. I've, I've written eight feature-length screenplays, a bunch of spec sitcoms and, and some other things, and I feel like I'm a better writer on the eighth one than I was on the first one, but what they all have in common is, is all the first drafts are pretty bad. Mm -hmm. you know, I thought they were really good when I first wrote the end, <laughs> yeah. but then upon further reflection, so yeah, just, you know, accept that out there, that that first draft, it's, it's just about yeah. putting it on the page. Right, absolutely. That's why I called my business on the page, right. because... Uh, I just wanted people to there stop. There I didn't even realize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted them to stop thinking so much about, you know, they, they were, it was all about theory and concept, and they, were, they kept sort of wrestling in here, and I was like, could you put it here? Mm -hmm. just, just do it. And, uh, and once they did, you know, it was a very freeing experience. But it's, it is just the beginning. Got to go back and rewrite. So uh, my two favorite words in the literary 
lexicon for me is the end. I'm, ah. very, I'm very excited when I type those two words uh -huh. after I struggled with it, what have you. So what should my next step be at that point? I, I finished my first draft. I type the end. Should I send it off to you mm -hmm. um, for advice right away? Should I work on it some more myself first, get feedback from friends, writers, groups? What do you think? I usually, I usually tell people before they send it to somebody like me, somebody they're going to have to pay. They need to take it as far as they can take it. Some people just want to hand it to me and say, you know, you do the rewrite. Which, make, it, make it good, people. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I'll say, you know, well, have you, you know, have you done as much as you can? Does it meet your intentions? If they say no, I'll, I'll be like, try and make it meet your intentions first. Because I'm going to come through and I'm going to give you some pretty big notes. If you haven't taken it as far as you can, you know, and I just hear, oh, I was going to do that, you've wasted your money. Um, so that, do that first, do that and, first, and then get the better advice after that. Absolutely. Then we can really go to the the craft of the page. You know, the nuances, all the stuff that makes makes uh, a script really cool. As far as giving it to your friends goes, yeah, just sorry, pick your friends. <laughs> you know, because you you know if you if you have hurt feelings easily, you know, and you give it to a, you know a friend who doesn't have the right language mm -hmm. to to use for why it's not working for him. There goes your friendship. So just be really careful with that. Yeah, and well, f take that one step further and talk about the importance of a writer having thick skin, though, mm. and, and being able to take that feedback. Yeah, that, I think that's where that sort of that little confidence, that little, little touch of arrogance really helps. Um, because the, the writers who do become successful, they have this thick skin where, you know, they've, they've given it to 20 people, 19 people have said, I don't get it, you know, right. and one person said, I get it, and I want to run with it. And they didn't listen to those other 19 people. You know, they were waiting for the person, the audience member, right. who connected with them. Well, and the beauty of that is, and something I keep reminding myself, is if you take the best of the best, the most popular of the most popular when it comes to TV, movie, music, whatever it is, they're still only liked, watched by a very small percentage of the overall population. Yeah. So if the best of the best is only liked and admired by a small percentage of the population, where does that leave the rest of us? <laughs> so of course a lot more people aren't going to get, like, be into for whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Part of being a good writer is knowing your audience when you're writing your material, right? And yeah. how to target it and so forth. Absolutely. You know, and uh, you know, as, as an analyst, I think my job is to always think like a great fan of whatever genre I'm reading. So even if it isn't a movie that I would go out to see, um, I got to think like, you know, okay, you know, I am a, a, a 25 year old sci fi guy who goes to Comic Con, right? right. I have to like <laughs> right, right. think that way. What am I expecting from a great movie? Now, for if you're writing a movie like that, you're not going to give it to a certain production company that makes, you know, the 2009 version of Terms of Endearment. So, you know, you have to know who your audience is, like you said, and, uh, and target it to the right people. Great. We have another instant message. Dave, do you have a preference in screenwriting software between Movie Magic and Final Draft? Is there any good free software you'd recommend? Mm, okay. Let's well, start to stick to the first half, yeah. uh, Final Draft and Movie Magic. You know, the only reason I recommend Final Draft is because I've used it, you know, and so I, I but I haven't used Movie Magic. I'm sure it's just as good. What you want to do if you're uh, a writer is you need some kind of software, and all software does is it doesn't do story for you. It just indents for you. It indents, it capitalizes, so that you don't have to think about that kind of stuff. So I would say any software that you have is probably going to work for you as a writer. I mean, in, in the industry, I think the final draft may be the, the one that's used the, the most, but I, I really can't say. I'm sure something, you know, that something may that Something that conforms to industry standards is important because I don't, want, I don't know if snobbery is the right word, but if you don't do things in the proper format, you kind of tip yourself off as not being an industry regular, if you will, and that can turn some people off. There are some people, I mean, it, it's hard, it's, it, industry format is so easy. I mean, we're just right. talking 12-point courier. Right, right. You know, so, so for me, I may just not be a stickler on it. I, I, if it looks like a script page, it is a script page. I can't guarantee that that doesn't mean that there aren't certain readers out there that won't, you know, sort of measure your margins. Right. But I also am always skeptical. If somebody's reading your script that way, how much attention are they paying to the story? Right. You know, so, um, 
Yeah, I'm not a stickler for it, but I'd say Final Draft Movie Magic. They both okay. work well. And if there's a great software out there that is being invented and you find out about it, email me. I want to know. Okay, well, my executive producer is a little more frisky than usual tonight. Brian, what do you got? I just wanted to butt in again. Uh, <laughs> if she says Final Draft, I'm going to say I'm going to agree with Final Draft, and here's why. Uh, and there's other script writing tools that do this, but as an assistant director, as an AD, the person that breaks the script down, I'm going to like you a lot more if you have uh, your Final Draft. Uh, now, there's uh, added things you can do. You can pretty much you can tag locations, props and items in there so uh, I can generate a report out of final draft and I can use that in my breakdown in my breakdown software so every time scene A comes up I know there's this table and this kitten or this prop and you can uh, break down those elements in final cut in final draft so if you're using that uh, the AD and the other people in the script supervisor all those people are going to like you a lot more particularly in an indie capacity where maybe they don't have the budget so everyone can spend the time breaking all those things down so that's uh, another reason I would just back up your recommendation of final draft that, thank you so much that, that was a good answer. Yeah. What's an Ethan here? Right. Uh, yeah, that was really good. Cool. Yeah. So now, okay, someone d does come to you. They are ready. They've developed it a little bit more. They come to you for coverage. What can they expect? How do you break down a script for them? Okay. I just want to sort of uh, define what, what coverage is versus notes because I don't do coverage. But uh, just you're going to hear the term coverage a lot. What script coverage is is something I used to do for the studios. Um, you're, it's a book report. You're reading a script, and then you're telling the executive um, what kind of a script you just read, what its strengths and weaknesses are, and whether it would make a good movie. A coverage is very definitive. It's very judgmental. Um, when I was doing it, my husband's nickname for me was Crusher of Dreams. <laughs> so now what I do, <laughs> you know, because that's not nice, um, now what I do is script notes, and that's what analysts and, and that's what script consultants should be doing. They're not just telling you it is or isn't a movie. They're saying this is how you fix it. Um, they're going into it page by page or, or line by line even and saying here's the things that I notice. So that's what I do is I'll, I'll, I'll look at a script, I'll talk to the writer about the big picture issues first and then I go through it with them sequence by sequence and sometimes we even script doctor right there on the spot. And then what happens? Do they go and they make those changes? Do they come back to see you? Do they resubmit it? No, you know, sometimes um, you know, I leave it to them because then they've got to pay me all over again. Right. Um, you know, sometimes they'll run with it and they'll make the changes and, and you know, they don't need me. Sometimes they'll feel like, no, I need, I need a second read. Um, I'd say about 50% of people make changes, come back, you know, and then we can tweak it even more. Uh, would you say a majority or how does your customer breakdown is do you mostly work with new writers um, more established writers I would say about 75 percent in my classes my big classes are uh, are new writers because a lot of people are you know they're trying to break story or they're trying to rewrite um, but you know I have 25 percent uh, that you know are successful writers that still even take class with me because they want to they want some new tools. They want to streamline their process. Or they just want to be in class again and get that, that energy behind them. I'm smiling because if and when my next script gets a, a pass from someone because of your husband, I'm going to think of the crusher of dreams. Crusher of <laughs> dreams. You know, that's going to stay That's right. Me. You just have that little mantra. Whatever, crusher of dreams. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, Batman, the Cape Crusader, is tuning in this evening. Uh, my first draft is 148 pages long. <laughs> Will industry read a script that is more than 120 pages? No. <laughs> no, and please don't give it to me either. You know, that, that's, that's, your, that's your first sign to go in and, and you haven't done everything that you can do. You know, you need to go in and you need to take yourself in hand and say, what can I part with? You know, you've heard that thing about killing your babies. Such a lovely, <laughs> you know, think about, about it as, you know, your precious darlings instead. Get rid of your precious darlings. Um, at least one of them, there it is. Your, your script is actually going to be better for it. So, yeah, please, 120 pages and under. Yeah, well, again, keeping in mind that the standard is, I guess, uh, one page represents a minute of screen time, mm -hmm. 148 pages is, is about two and a half hours. Yeah. And how many movies do you see in the theater that are two and a half hours in length? And I bet the ones that you do see that are of that length mm -hmm. are by megastar directors or big event movies right. with massive budgets. They're not 
first time or second time indie writers but also more the often script than not. may not have been that long that may have been the interpret interpretation of the director that suddenly wants to sort of you know take the landscape and 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 go wide with it and really spend time and wants to slow it down and and have those looks and stuff that doesn't mean that the script was that long that right. means the director has chosen a certain pace and uh, and that would be wonderful so yeah I do get that question a lot well what about these three-hour movies it was it was probably the process of the filmmaking rather than a, a big dense overwritten script now for the aspiring writer who reads books who takes seminars watches DVDs mm -hmm. does all that kind of stuff and gets all these rules and, and gets the coverage and the script is not going to get a consider because of this reason that reason the other what do you say to that cynical writer who says yeah but I go to the movies all the time and I don't see inciting incidents within the first five minutes and I don't see all these rules that my script is getting rejected for apply to most of the movies I see your scripts probably not getting rejected because it, your, your script's not getting rejected because you didn't follow the rules. This, your script's probably getting rejected because we can see it. We, it's like with an actor, mm -hmm. when you can see the process, you can see them acting, right, right. it doesn't work for you. When it seems effortless, like they're being, that's when it's really working. So it's the same thing with a script. You don't see the inciting incident. That's because it was so beautifully crafted. It's subtle, it's organic, it's authentic. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, you know, kudos to that writer for making you think it wasn't there, right. you know. So I, I would also say, you know, once you know those rules, just like you said, right. get off of it. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, it, it's something to keep yourself in check, to get a basic understanding of structure and, and you know, how you know, myths have, have uh, affected storytelling, all those things. But after a while, it's just you and your characters and your idea. And that is what should really run the show. Well, even in, uh, I'll give a, a little bit away, in the Q&A on your DVD, I think mm -hmm. one of your students was asking you, you know, do you have to do the exercises in order or, or this right this particular way? And you mm -hmm. were saying, no, do it in a way that, you know, works best for you. Absolutely. Cherry would like to ask, in the age of reality TV and post-writer strike, mm -hmm. in your opinion, do you think it's harder to get a script seen and produced? Um, yeah, uh, well, definitely TV these days, with the writer's strike as, especially. But um, an interesting thing has happened that's, that's good for the TV writer, which is that people are interested in um, uh, original pilots where they never used to be before, never. Um, it used to be that, you know, original pilots, they were all in-house, but now they're, they, they are open to reading them. Sometimes they're open to reading them just as writing samples, you know, but it, it's, it's a... Uh, it's, it just says that um, there's, there is some room for you as far as creating original works on television. Um, but yeah, reality TV has dominated a lot. My husband actually writes for reality TV. And um, on the other end of this, a lot of my writers get work as reality TV writers because there's still somebody who has to craft the story that comes out of the reality so you could look at it as the death of storytelling, or you could look at it as a different kind of storytelling, because I'll make you a bet that you're hooked on a certain reality show. Too. <laughs> we all are, you know? <laughs> like, I was, we were watching Kitchen Nightmares, like, till dawn last night. You know, we, we've, like, been taping the BBC version. Uh -huh. I can't stop watching, uh, you know, this guy just yell at people. It's, <laughs> I, I, I'm addicted to it. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, fill in these sentences for me. Okay. Good writers have this in common. Good writers have, oh God, I had such a good one before. <laughs> now, um, good writers have a, a, a love of their craft in common. They're not just chasing uh, the, the monetary benefits. So good, love, good writers have a love of their craft. And five good habits of writers are? Five good habits of writers. I was also figuring this out. <laughs> in my, I was like, okay, five, five. All right, so here they are. Um, uh, uh, yes, I love the craft. That's one. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is uh, a, a certain discipline with their writing. Um, I'm sorry, a, a certain writing routine. A writing routine. Now, that doesn't mean, have to mean every single day. You may not be that kind of writer. You might be that binge bur purge writer, but you know that you're going to purge on a weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, or I'm sorry, you're going to binge on a weekend. Right, right. Um, so, uh, you're going to so, throw up all your writing. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're going to just indulge, yeah. you know, on a, on a Saturday and a Sunday. That's when you're going to write. Or you're going to write at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't care. But a certain routine with their writing. 
Um, I would say also that they're not afraid to be b bad or to be silly as number three. Um, and number four is that thick skin that we talked about. Oh, and number five was beautiful, but it's out of my head. Oh my God, what was it? You'll have to come to my classes to find out number five. Uh, I don't know. Take good so notes. Good. That was it. I'll oh, get out of here. Dude, that was so good. Yes, yes. I just said, dude. That That's was okay. that was wrong. Can you that was that? very spontaneous. Can't cut that out. Can't it's cut live, that out. right? It's live. Um, yeah. Number five. Actually, it was take notes. So let's reverse it for a second. Number four is take notes, but number five is to still be able to play and be creative. I'm glad my sarcasm can come in handy. Um, so now, real quickly, I want to go over a, f a few things that you're doing. Well, first, what are some of the things that people learn in your DVD, some of the headlines? Um, some of the headlines would be um, they're going to learn an outlining process that is not going to be a 25-page outline. They're going to learn to uh, go from uh, premise into pages in a very quick, streamlined fashion that still gets their major story beats in there, um, scene activity, and is true to their characters. Great. And the seminar at the end of the month, that is going to be about? Yeah, it's about scene work. It's about all the, the cool stuff in scenes from, uh, you know, the, those great lines of dialogue, um, those wonderful character moments, uh, the, 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 the blow of a scene, like what is the scene really about, um, and, uh, and how scenes tell great stories. And I'm going to be using a lot of film examples. And where do, you, where do people go to find out about that? That is something I'm doing through creative screenwriting. And uh, you can go to the screenwriting, Creative Screenwriting Magazine uh, website, and that will be in uh, Beverly Hills uh, on Sunday, July 26th, okay. I believe. Now, for people watching this in the archives, you do this every, a few times a year. So you can always go to the website of Creative Screenwriting to see when the next time you'll be teaching? Actually, you know, there is a screenwriting expo that I'm at every year, but what they should really go to, <laughs> if you're not here and you can't get the July 26th class, um, is uh, go to onthepage.tv, because that has everywhere I'm going to be. Like, I'm going to be in New York uh, July 11th. I'll be teaching a rewrite class. And I also teach six-week classes out of my studio in Sherman Oaks, if you are here. Um, and I offer, you know, things online uh, online tools things so like on that. the page.tv that is your website that is my website and you, can, you, find and you can also link to all your podcasts from there too there's yeah a, a yeah there's a little podcast link but you can also find the podcast on iTunes um, and it's called on the page everything's on the page That's right. yeah <laughs> so good deal it's, it's a lot of great stuff a lot of great information thank I want you. to thank you so much for coming on today. oh you're welcome thank you for having me Oh, my pleasure. That is going to do it for this edition of Filmnet. I want to strongly encourage any established writer, existing writer, new writer, someone thinking about writing, to check out her website, get her DVD if you're even remotely thinking about it. It's great. I'm looking forward to writing my, using it as the basis of writing my next script. And that's about it. I can't endorse it anymore. See you guys next time on Filmnet. Huh?